Hey, um, folks, I think we're ready to get started. I'm sorry we're running a little bit late, but um, we have a terrific speaker with us um, today, um, Mr. Robert Hilton Smith, who is a, um, a, a public policy um, analyst at Demos, which is a, an organization here in New York City which I'll talk about a little bit in a second. Um, <clears throat> but Mr. Hilton Smith, um, his main interest is in um, retirement security, which I know affects and, and is an issue for a lot of us um, uh, in this room. And um, his other interests um, include health care law and um, uh, fiscal policy, um, economic um, fiscal policy and uh, also um, the issue of uh, student uh, debt, uh, among other things. So, um, <laughs> so today he's going to focus more on the uh, retirement security issue, but uh, he also um, plans to speak for just a little while and then have folks really ask him questions. So if you want to ask him more questions about other um, other issues that would be that would be fine. The other thing I failed to mention now that I have my proper page in front of me, um, he's also been very interested in the excessive and hidden costs at 401ks and uh, how Wall Street is ripping us off there also. Um, and he has done a lot of writings for um, various publications, the Washington Post, Kiplinger, um, Newsweek, among others. He's been on Fox News. Um, he uh, has many articles online, which you can just Google his name and uh, come up with. Um, Mr. Hilton Smith has a master's in economics from New School, as well as a bachelor's in uh, philosophy and mathematics from Guilford College. Um, I just wanted to say a word also about Demos, which is the group that he works for in New York and uh, to say that that is a public policy institute. Its major um, interest is in um, expanding and uh, uh, strengthening democracy in America. And they have three commitments, the first being to reduce the role of money in politics. Um, the second is to um, basically create strategies for a sustainable economy that will um, increase and strengthen the middle class. And thirdly, um, quote, transforming the public narrative to elevate the values of community and racial equity. So I am very proud to um, introduce Robert Hilton Smith. Really glad to be here to chat with you guys today. And it's, as Karen said, I'm going to really try to structure it much more as a chat rather than be just babbling on for ages. Go through and talk some about retirement security, talk about Social Security and the chain CPI thing, which I know people are worried about. Talk about 401ks a little bit, since that's what I always babble about, and uh, what we may be able to do to fix it. And then we can talk about whatever you want. I do work on money and politics, actually, as well. We can talk about that, can talk about student debt, can talk about unemployment, all, uh, you know, my, my list of interests really is just, you know, the most fascinating list of interests ever I know for most people. So uh, I'm glad people want to hang out and talk about some relatively important stuff. So um, I'm also uh, just about done with my PhD at the new school, hopefully. So hopefully be able to add that degree to it soon. Uh, we'll see. But <clears throat> in any case, um, I want to start out talking about Social Security a little bit because it really was and is the pillar of our retirement system and what really changed really the entire fortunes of older people in this country, right? Before Social Security, 50% of elderly people were in poverty. Now they're among the least poor age groups and really specifically because of Social Security. And I mean, I don't think it's a stretch to say that it's the most successful government program that's ever been created. You know, I, I'm more than I don't, I don't I don't feel at all weird saying that whatsoever. I think that's not a bold statement. But and you know, it's it's under attack right now. But it it's been under attack for you know well since it was since before it was created. You know, you can go and look at newspaper clips from the the 30s when republicans were commenting then oh it's going to destroy it's going to bankrupt us it's going to destroy our economy uh you know the the 
people love to quote those kind of clips. So people have been saying it for 80 years. But, you know, for, for me anyway, I haven't been, I wasn't, I was barely born when in 83 the reforms happened. Uh, and so to me this feels really imminent and really threatening because for people of my generation, Social Security could be about all we have. You know, we don't have pensions any longer. 401ks aren't helping anybody. Um, and short of anything else, like, you know, our, our wages aren't looking good. Our, you know, my, my generation, you know, I'm 30, um, is, has the highest unemployment rate. You know, things are not looking so great. So if we don't, you know, stop and protect this here, it's, uh, it's troubling. So when, when a Democratic president comes out with a proposal to significantly cut Social Security, that's, uh, that's pretty worrisome to me. So let me, let me talk first about that because, um, you know, we'll talk about pensions and 401ks a little bit, but, you know, Social Security is the most important income source for older people. It's, um, one, one stat that I always like to quote is 40% of people over 65 get over 80% of their income from Social Security. So, and 60% and get more than 60% of it. So it is the most important income source for really two thirds of all older people, you know, and, and cutting it when the benefits on average are only $14,000 a year, that is the average benefit, you know, even $1,000 off that, which is what the chain CPI would do by age 85, that can mean the difference between paying rent or being able to, you know, buy anything decent to eat, you know, and, and not. And so, I, I mean, I think this is really why it's especially troubling. So. Let me talk a minute about how this this cut would work, and many of you all may be familiar with it, so I won't go into too much detail. But the this this cut that President Obama's proposed in this year's budget is is called the Chain CPI, and basically what it does is it switches to. They claim it switches to a more accurate measure of inflation. So every year, your benefits, Social Security benefits, get increased by a little bit, two three percent, and that's to keep up with inflation, with rising prices, right? And they and then it's. The amount that that gets increased is based on, you know, this complex measure all, all us silly economists have come up with, and they want to switch to a different measure. But all it is is just a disguised a benefit cut in disguise. It's not. If you go and talk to people, nobody thinks the new measure is really more accurate, except maybe you know the Milton Friedmans of the world or something like that. You know, um, so I mean, it's just a sneaky way to cut benefits. So what happens is every year. Instead of going up by 3%, they'll go up by 2%. And it's a little bit more complicated than that. But basically, the outcome is by age, um, if you live to age 85, it means you have about $1,000 less a year. Um, and if you look at it cumulatively, in other words, if you add up all the cuts every year, it's something like $6,000, uh, no, $12,000 in total cuts um, by the time, you know, uh, um, some, you know, an average Social Security retiree might die. It's like $12,000 out of your pocket is what it is. And that's just an average, you know, person who's only getting 14000 a year. If you get more from Social Security, the cuts are going to be more because it's a percentage. So, you know, it's, it's um, and it, it's a really sneaky thing. I mean, um, you know, I, I would actually really prefer, if we want to have this debate about cutting benefits, why don't we just do it up front instead of trying to pretend like, oh, we're switching to a more accurate measure of inflation, you know, it's not a cut. It's just being more accurate, but so um, you know, I, mean, I could get into the details about the that more if you want to understand what they mean by that and why it's inaccurate. But that's the kind of summary of it. Uh, I've read far too much about this, I guess. But um, but you know the reason that this is this is so problematic, as I said, is because you know we used to call this retirement system a three-legged stool. People have heard that analogy before. It never really was a three-legged stool. That's ridiculous. You know. Nobody had, the three-legged stool was Social Security, pensions, and, and personal savings of some sort. But very few people had significant personal savings. They ever had that. And really, not as many people had pensions as you'd think. At the peak, even only about 60% of people even had a pension. So it was really always a one-legged stool, basically, which is Social Security, you know. Um, but there were a lot of people, and many of you guys may have pensions from places, you know, and, and my generation isn't going to have any of them. Out of my generation, um, I think people my age, 25 to 34, I think it's 13% uh, work for a company that has a, has a pension. So, uh, the way I would, no one even knows that I talk to my friends about, like, what's a pension? <laughs> Somebody gives you money for the rest of your life? Wow, that sounds cool. But... <clears throat> So, uh, so, you know, we're left with trying to save in these 401ks, and that's what I've spent a lot of time researching, uh, and just really how, 
how terrible they are. You know, they really, they're not a retirement plan. I mean, I've really, and, and I'll, I'll uh, be a little self-aggrandizing uh, right now. I just want to, on, on Tuesday, there's a Frontline special coming out on this, um, Tuesday at, at 10, and I'm in it a lot, about all about the 401k and how bad they are. So, uh, um, if you want to hear much me babble more about it, I guess you can watch Frontline. But uh, I say the same thing in there, is that, uh, they're not a retirement savings plan, they're really just a way to transfer money from us to Wall Street, basically. I mean, when you look at them over time, and I did all these, these calculations and put out this paper, you know, Wall Street takes about a third of all of what you put in there. I mean, they literally take, you, you put $100, they're gonna take $33 of it in the end. They're gonna get it in little bits over the years, but that's what it ends up being, basically. Like, and it's, yeah, okay, it's better than stuffing it under your mattress still. You will, you're not gonna, well, a lot of times you'll lose money. You won't always lose money, but uh, over the long run you should gain some. But it's just, it's not, it's not a sustainable way to save. And the data is showing that too. People about to retire, 55 to 64, only have an average of about, about $100,000 saved, right? And actually, oh, I'm sorry, only 50% of people have anything saved at all. And out of those 50%, but they have about 100,000. 100,000 sounds like a lot of money, right? But it's really about $7,000 a year is what it means, you know, if you're for the rest of your life, which, I mean, you know, it's not insignificant, but it's not rent even here, you know? Uh, so it's not, you know, you add that 7,000 to the 14,000 for Social Security, that's 21,000 a year, you know? That's not a, it's not a king's ransom you're living on there by any means, you know? Um, so I can definitely talk more about 401ks, you know, that's what I've spent a lot of time on. I can talk about investing some, I, talk, I do a lot of that, that kind of talking as well. Um, index funds is always what I tell people, but, um, uh, but you know, I mean, I think that I really, really want to see more what you got, which parts of this, this whole conversation you want to talk about, you want me to talk about more. I can talk about the chain CPI, I can explain how all that works. I can talk more about 401ks. I can talk more about pensions. So I really just want to open it up and see which of these parts you guys are most interested in. Or we can talk about student debt. Or we can talk about money in politics, any of this. You know, I've been doing research on all of these recently and uh, um, I'm really happy to talk about any of them. So I just want to kind of give that overview and then really just see what parts people want me to talk about more. It's, it, it, number doesn't even make any sense, you know. I'm sorry. Please repeat her. Question. Oh yes, yes, yes. Uh, the question was how, what role do all these derivatives play in, in any of this, in our, in our debt, especially in the retirement savings and stuff like that. Um, and the answer is actually a lot bigger role than you think. Um, I'll tell you a personal story about derivatives, which really shocked me. Um, so I got my, this is my first, like, let's say, career track job that I got with Deepmas. I had, you know, I've been working since I was 15, but this is the first real job, I guess, you know. Um, and I, you know, got my 401k, and I was like, okay, well, all right, I guess this is what I got, so I better start putting money into it. And there's a list of 25 funds or whatever, and, you know, this is even my specialty, and I'm like, they're all the same, I don't really care, you know, so I kind of checked off some, <laughs> like, literally, I mean, I, I you know, I, that, I'm being a little facetious here, I put a little bit in bonds, some in a large cap fund, some in a, you know, in index funds, that kind of thing, but, you know, I was just, I wasn't, you know, I don't, I don't have a lot of faith in any of them, so, uh, <laughs> so, and then I was like, so when I was doing this, this researching on the 401k fees, I went back into depth on like, okay, what actually are these individual funds investing in. One of them that I was invested in was called J.P. Morgan Government Bond Fund. And I was like, okay, you know, that was supposed to be my safe investment. I was like, okay, that, that one's gonna give me, it's in treasury bonds, I'm sure. But if you go into the portfolio of each fund, you can get a lot of detail on what that is invested in. And I was like, because I was kind of suspicious, because I was like, why is this thing returning 6% a year? Government bonds don't return that much, right? And I go in there and sure enough, it's all in mortgage-backed securities. And so I find out that I'm invested in mortgage-backed securities. You know, I get my money out of there immediately. Uh, but the, you know, like they're 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 everywhere. Even in something that says J.P. Morgan Government Bond Fund in my 401k. You know, your pension fund. If you have a pension through, you know, like if if you have a New York State, let's say, teacher's pension, 
They're invested in tons of derivatives, tons of derivatives. You know, they're invested in hedge funds, private equity. I did analysis of their portfolio a while back. You know, they have like $10 billion in, in derivatives still, even after they've gotten rid of their portfolio. They've got another $30 billion in private equity and hedge funds, which then are themselves invested in derivatives in our places. It's still everywhere. You know, it's still really, really bad news. So it really is kind of amazing how much they play into all of these, all of these kind of things, you know, and of course, the biggest way I guess they play in is where, you know, we had to bail out all those banks and, you know, that's now, supposedly now basically why we have to cut all the government programs because we spent all the money bailing out the banks and now we're supposedly broke and thus we can't afford to pay people $14,000 a year after they work their whole lives anymore, I guess, you know, that's really the, what I see is the chain of logic, which is ridiculous, but, sir. Speaking of bailing out the banks, supposedly we can, we can no longer expect the taxpayers to bail out the banks. So now the FDIC and the Bank of England have reached an agreement that like in Cyprus, if JP Morgan Chase or Bank of America, which have the biggest derivative exposures, mm -hmm. more than all the money on earth, if they fail, they will just confiscate our deposits since we're not secured creditors and the derivatives in a bankruptcy come first oh, interesting. as a claim. In other words, the depositors would be issued stock <clears throat> as unsecured creditors and uh, that would bail out the bank, you know, all our deposits. That does not surprise me. Which I hadn't heard that. Which thing to publicize if you want people to say, well, I might as well put my money in the stock market because they're not safe in the bank. Right, According it's no longer FBI guaranteed any longer. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they can't, if they're telling you it's not safe and secure, who, who's going to tell you it is? Uh, I mean, it increasingly seems like you should just put your money under your mattress, honestly. <laughs> Actually, no, you should still invest in government bonds, actually, because they still do return <laughs> a great rate of return until they, uh, well, we'll see what happens. But if the Treasury bond, I have to say this, if the Treasury bond isn't returning a return, the whole, econ the whole world economy is, is uh, in trouble. So, and we'll probably be, it'll probably be like a water world kind of Mad Max scenario at that point. So I think Treasury bonds are safe up until then. So uh, I don't, I, there's a million hands. Um, whoever had their, this lady in the pink right here, I guess. So um, usually when you say something is the subject of a frontline documentary, it's all about uh, investigations and disclosures mm -hmm. that the public is unaware of. Mm -hmm. So my question is about news coverage. Mm. And you know, those of us who are avid readers of the New York Times, but sure. also the alternative press to a certain degree, uh, where, where do you recommend um, investing in terms of learning and following the news? Yeah, it's, it's been a real, it's a really good question. It's a real struggle for me too, because I, you know, as someone who's pretty critical of news coverage, you know, uh, a lot of times it seems really biased towards the financial sector and towards, um, you know, I read, I mean, it's not like reading the Wall Street Journal, but even reading the Times financial pages does kind of seem like, oh, these banks are making reasonable mistakes and, you know, they're the only things holding our system together, like it does seem very, um, you know, so I mean, I read, I read The Guardian a lot myself. Uh, they're, I think they do a much better job. Um, I guess I've been reading them more since my good friend got a job there, uh, but, <laughs> but I really do think they do a good job. And I love reading, as far as economists go, Dean Baker is my favorite. Um, and he does a really great job of being honest and he runs a column in The Guardian, Guardian every week. Um, so if you want to get it, like the good perspective on especially budget issues or the social security stuff, he really breaks it down really nicely for you. Um, Dean Baker. Mm -hmm. I read one called Naked Capitalism. Uh, that's a really, that, that's my favorite one as far as again giving a relatively good perspective. If you want to get a perspective on the financial sector, like that, that's in depth if you're one of the like a wonk or a geek or whatever like me who really likes to get into the nitty gritty of stuff, there's one called Zero Hedge that really is reasonable. It doesn't defend the banks at all. In fact, it, it usually, but it, it, that's one gets really, like if you want to really understand what a, a credit default swap is, they will tell you in a series of articles when you want to know more than you ever wanted to know about it. You know, it's so, um, 
but uh, but but yeah, Frontline is. is uh, I think it will be really good. The special, actually, I really do think they really did talk to a gazillion people and got stonewalled by a bunch of people, actually, too. But I really hope. I'm really hopeful that they're going to really get kind of expose this to some degree for what it is. So. Why don't you let me uh, call on people so that you can pay attention to what uh, All right, I'm going to call on three people at, the, at a time. Great, right? thank you. I appreciate One, that. One, two, because you had your hand up for a while. Uh, a third person. Third, okay. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you. appreciate it. It's a condition. <laughs> you got to take the mic. <laughs> With uh, all these uh, undergraduates and graduates uh, piling up these enormous amounts of student debt, which seems to me is going to be impossible for them to repay. It Certainly is. Not it is. In a, in a normal working life. What do you see as the outcome of this? Uh, the next one. More and more students are just being buried under, under student debt. Yeah, I mean, it, it's the next bubble. That's what it is. Um, it's over a trillion dollars now, as we all know. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be lucky if a third of it's repaid, honestly, you know, or maybe half, you know, I mean, we're, so we're talking $500 billion that is going to, you know, be the next bubble in essence. I mean, it's the exact same way. It's in what people are taking out mortgages for houses that weren't worth what they said. People are taking, this is like a mortgage for a degree that's not worth what people says it is. It's the same thing, you know, and also it's 18 year old kids, 17 year old kids making decisions about these things. You know, I had, I was on a show once and, and it was there with the show where someone was asking me if it made sense to take out $100,000 in debt to get a film degree from Brown. And I was like, you're asking me this question? No, that's terrible. <laughs> Like, 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 but, but they're, you know, they're 17. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing when I was 17. When I, when I was 17, I applied to 11 schools, actually, and I, I got into 10 of them, which was great. Um, and I had this big chart of all the schools that I got into, the money they offered, and I wanted to go to the most expensive one, you know? And my dad was like, kid, you know, you've got graduate school ahead of you, you know, like, we're going to help you some with undergrad. We're not helping you with graduate school. Like, you need to, you need to come out of undergrad debt-free so you can have some room you know, to do stuff later. And I thought, I was like, oh no, what is, what's $40,000 in debt? Who cares? You know, they, they're not able to make these honestly kind of decisions at that point. And then their parents tell them not to, and then of course they do exactly what their parents tell them not to. Uh, thankfully I didn't. I went to the, the school that gave me the best deal and that was, I'm so glad for that in the end. But, but what's gonna happen, it's gonna, it already is having an effect on our whole economy, right? It's having an effect on our housing market right now. No one's buying houses because the, the group of us who should be buying houses right now can't afford to buy them, right? Um, you, even myself, I'm, I'm doing okay as far as my, my class is concerned. I still have, I have 45,000 in student debt, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, I'll pay it, I'll, I'll be able to pay it back, but, you know, most of the rest of my compatriots are not gonna be able to. So it's gonna do that, you know, and then it's going to, it's gonna have an effect on everything, on the job market, on, you know, it really is, it, it really will be a huge problem. We're just starting to see it. Now we're starting to see these default rates creep up. Um, and then if enough people start defaulting, there's gonna have to be something done right now. Because right now it's not dischargeable in bankruptcy. You cannot get rid of it. You go to bankruptcy, they just keep making you pay it. You can get rid of credit card debt, but you can't get rid of student debt. How does this make any sense? So we're actually trying to advocate for getting this changed back again to being able to actually get rid of student debt in bankruptcy when it's, you know, you should be able to declare bankruptcy for anything, but if you're really, really in trouble, you should be able to restructure this in some way, you know, but. Oh. As I sit here, I'm getting increasingly anxious. <laughs> it happens to me every day. <laughs> and a large part of that is due to the fact that I am extraordinarily ignorant <laughs> about this field. You say something like CPI. I write down CPI. I don't even know what that is. Mm -hmm. This is not my field. Mm -hmm. I'm that lady that you said will be 85 years old very soon in December. Thankfully, it won't affect you, hopefully. So, fingers oh, crossed. So. My Second question is still valid. Mm -hmm. I understand enough to know how what the banks did, how they operate, but what's a credit union? Could you just tell me if I should not only hate Citibank, where a portion of my money is, but should I take that money and put it some? I mean, that's a sort of a personal financial question, but maybe it pertains 
to others here. Definitely. So I hope you can just tell me what is a credit union. I'd love to. I'm. I'm. Always, I love answering personal finance questions. Actually, that's my favorite thing in some ways because yeah, of course because I'm a. You know, we we all this scene does seem so overwhelming. You know, and it's like I I'm not gonna. You know, even though I. I've met with, you know, I've met, I'm going to meet with Elizabeth Warren in a week or two, you know, like, and I, I'm going to go meet with the, um, the new um, Consumer Financial Protection Board, you know, like, I, I'm still not going to be able to change whether this change CPI happens or not, you know, like, and it gets really overwhelming, it gets frustrated, I can't change any of this, but one thing you can change is what you do with your own money and the choices you make and the things that you buy, so I always like so talking about that. For a CPI is, is called the Consumer Price Index, oh, right, okay. and it is the measure of how much basically prices go up every year, right? So basically how it works is they have, the, it's a little bit of health care, a little bit of food, a little bit of this, and they, they go out and measure, you know, okay, how much did the price of, you know, uh, an MRI go up um, this year? And then that goes into the calculation, you know, and what they're doing is they're switching to a lower, lower measure, this chain CPI thing, which basically pretends like you can go to the grocery store and uh, apples are really expensive, so I'm just gonna buy, you know, bananas instead, you know. One, people don't do that generally. You go there to buy beef, you're gonna buy beef. You're not gonna buy chicken necessarily. I mean, you might, but, but you can't always just switch to this. Or like, they also pretend that this is the same quality of life, right? If you have to go, if you wanna go buy wheat bread and you have to buy Wonder Bread, that's not the same thing, but that's what they're assuming you're gonna do under this new measure, it's ridiculous. And then also you can't, there's no substitute for a, an MRI or a, you know, like you can't, you can't go, I'm gonna go to, you know, uh, the, the cheap healthcare place to get the MRI for cheaper. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's all ridiculous, you know, but credit unions. Credit unions are, um, they vary in, in the way that they work, right? But generally they are kind of what the, the name says, right? Most of them are not for, not for profit. I think in fact all of them are not for profit, right? They're, they're a union of people coming together to put the, pool their money together and, you know, do it in, in a better way than the big banks do. Um, so really the only difference is, is, is generally that it's not-for-profit and they often have a better, you know, some of them have social missions, some of them are, you know, make sure to only invest in, in good things. So they all have different, you know, in, in socially responsible investing. Yes, they're just the same as a regular bank. They're backed up, well, by <laughs> the FDIC, which may, apparently may not be as much of a backup as it, is, as it used to be, but um, well, actually, for the credit unions, it is because they don't own any of the derivatives or anything like that, you know. So it is a very safe place to put your money. Same kind of investment options you can get anywhere else. You can go through one of them and get a, you know, a brokerage account if you want to put your money in stocks, or you can get a, you know, a CD from them, or any of these same kind of products. You can go to them. And there's one in New York City. God, I'm supposed to remember the news. Is it MCI? Is that right? Not MCI. MCU, thank you. That is that is one of the best, and I always try to point people to. They're, they're, um, they're they do everything right. You know, they support unions. They um, invest only in good things. I forget. There's a million good things about them. What do the initials stand for? Municipal credit. credit. Thank you, thank you. They're 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 the best. And I'm always, okay. I'm gonna remember that from now on. They're the ones I'm always supposed to say. So. But definitely switch over. There's, I have my money in Chase too, and I need to get it out of there. So, yeah, they're both they're both awful. <clears throat> Chase made its money by financing the intercontinental slave trade, actually originally. But that's another point. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I'm in the process now of switching my money out of Citibank. Since Good. I started charging twenty dollars a month for my putting my whole salary into into their. <laughs> Uh, checking account. Are you kidding me? They're charging me twenty dollars. So that was a straw that broke the camel's back. Um, but anyway, um, I wanted to uh, ask you two things, and, and I know that's cheating. But the first is, on the, on the news, even on NPR, you hear that there is now an increase in in housing, uh, um, in, in buying houses, mm -hmm. and that we're you know. To me, it sounds like, are we in for another bubble here? Who's buying those houses? Is it the people that have all the money who are, you know, uh, closing on all the foreclosures? And I, I am curious about that. I'd love to hear your response. And Definitely. the second thing is, I actually um, had wanted to hear a little bit about your uh, proposal for pension plans for um, Americans. I didn't get into that. I gladly, I always gladly talk about that. So. Um, Housing, first of all, it, it's a little bit of a misnomer what you keep hearing. It's gone up, 
but only from the lowest level ever, right? So it's going back up, but it's still nowhere near where it was before the crash, you know? So going up is a, is a good thing, actually, at this point, because we were so low, no one was buying anything. We do need to get back up to a, another point. And, so, and the people buying them, you know, it, it, it does vary. There are some, there is some speculation out there. There are people buying up distressed properties. That's still going on. Some people, though, some regular people buying up distressed properties and just taking advantage of, of a bad, you know, making something good out of a bad situation, you know. Um, and, and, but there are a lot of regular people buying it. Some of my generation is finally starting to buy their first homes, just not nearly as much as should be right now, you know, but still, you know, half of us are buying our first homes instead of 65% of us or something. I mean, that's what we're talking about here. So it is a wide swath of things, but it's nothing to worry about yet. Not till, unless it doubles from its current level. We're still so low that we're not even close to that. Um, and and to, to, to briefly talk about my, my, my pension proposal, um, uh, it's actually not mine, it's Dr. Teresa Ghilarducci's originally, who was my dissertation advisor. Um, she works at the New School. She's great and been a tireless advocate for this over the years. Um, and basically the idea is to replace the 401k. We think it's completely broken. We think something new needs to happen. And what this new thing is, is I don't know how many of you have TIA CREF through your workplace. Some of you probably. Great. So it is the TIAA part of TIA CREF. That is our proposal, literally. Uh, we stole it from there and from something called a cash balance plan. To us what that means. I will. I will. So what it is, is it, with you, it would be accounts that would be administered by the government, but it would be still invested in the regular financial markets, right? And they'd be individual accounts, but they wouldn't be like 401ks, right? One, they'd actually follow you from job to job, which they don't do right now. I tried to roll over my 401k. I can't, I can't even figure out how to do it, honestly. Um, it's a big, for some reason, mine is a big pain. Um, they would also give you a guaranteed return is the best part about it. It would be a lower return. You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't make 20% in a year, but you're not going to lose 30% either. The, you know, the mechanics still have to be worked out because this hasn't been put into place, but you know, something like a 5% return in the vicinity, 4%. That's what TIA CREF has been offering for about 80 years now in, in that thing. So you get a guaranteed return. The best thing about it is you get a cheap annuity at retirement. So that means you can turn that pot of money into a, a pension, basically, into a lifetime stream of income. They, so you give, them, you give them whatever you and your employer and everybody saved, and they say, okay, we'll give you X a month. You turn over the pot to them, and they say, we'll give you X a month until you die guaranteed, right? So it, 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 it's, it's in between a 401k and a, and a pension, in essence, in that you're not promised a certain amount. What you save is what you kind of get in the end. But it doesn't go up and down like a 401k, and you can actually not have to worry about spending your mo all your money before you die. Not, you, know, you don't have to make what I call that morbid calculation of being like, well, I'll probably live to 85, so, you know, or, or man, my family's got a terrible history. I'm not going to make it past 80. Like, it's terrible. Why should people be doing that? Trying to be like, oh, I need to make this money last 15 years. Like, that's awful, you know? So, uh, so that's, that, that's kind of our basic proposal. And, um, it actually, uh, really happy, it got passed in California recently. Um, and if you look up, uh, God, what's it called, the Secure Choice Plan, uh, this, this stupid name that consultants came up with, um, it is our plan, uh, Senate Bill 1234 actually is what it is. But, and uh, right now it's going through a feasibility study that's required, but it went through both houses, Governor Brown signed it, and uh, we're really hopeful to get implemented next year. Um, so for the first time, there'll be a, a better alternative to this. Um, and you know, the, other, the other good thing about it, of course, is, is all the money will be pooled. No, there's no choices of investment options. Everybody gets, just gets this return out. And instead of me trying to figure out, uh, should I invest in a large cap growth fund or a small cap, let the people who are professionals do it, honestly. I want, I, I'm not a professional this. I mean, I can give you some advice, but I want the people who do this 40 days, 40 hours a week for 30 years to be the ones in charge of this. And they, and, and, and data and history has proven they get much better returns than any of us do. You know, that, that's true. Okay, three hands. One, two, three. One, two, three. Is this on? Yeah, okay. Um, I wanted to ask you about but the state banks, or um, I forget whether it's North Dakota or South Dakota. North Dakota, North Dakota. Yep. Dakota. And that, that was one of the few banks that didn't you know, self-destruct during the crisis. Mm -hmm. And what are the chances of something like this becoming more prevalent? 
I, I love the idea of state banks. Um, so for those of you who don't know, North Dakota actually has what is literally a state-run bank. Um, and it is there, it's, in, it's been around since, I don't know, the 20s or something like that. And it's there to serve the people of North Dakota, right? So it makes, it only makes loans in the interest of people in its state, you know? It makes loans to small businesses to get them started, but it's only, it's, it's, it's just for the good of people of North Dakota, basically. And it's, it is the only state that has one, but we have several people in Demos, actually, who that, they, they're really have been pushing that idea, have not had a lot of traction, unfortunately. But it's, a, it's an absolutely fabulous idea. Right now, in general, the idea is generally that you wouldn't be able to put your money necessarily in there. It's really more of a commercial thing, like to make loans to businesses and, and things like that. But it would be great if it, it would be, yeah, exactly. It's much better than those businesses getting their loans from Citibank or something like that. You know, they'll lend it to you at a reasonable rate of interest. It would be great if you could also put your money in there and then your money could go out to support small businesses. How great would that be, huh? You know, instead of going for like at a not-for-profit rate. But it does not seem to be a, a really on the table right now. And I don't know why in the wake of the financial crisis. But there's, if, you, if you look at our website, we have several papers on state banks, actually, if you want to learn more about it. I really appreciate so much of what you're saying. And, uh, explaining the change CPI is really, if we're going to change Social Security, let's do this upright. Because uh, mm -hmm. it and always not kind of benign, it's this minor technical correction. Exactly. Yeah, a few people are going to be hurt. But what I wanted to ask, as, and my family's uh, familiar with student loan debt from when uh, my wife and I were in college and graduate school, and now two children. and the. I'm not quite sure how to phrase it. It seems like student loan interest rates range from or graduate 6.9 percent to 10, 11, 12 percent. You go to the bank and you can get one percent. The multiple or the spread seems astounding. And who's making this money? And some of it's the government. Most of it's the government, unfortunately. And sort of like, why? Is this, a, this kind of feels like, I would like to think that's low fruit to pick off and fix. Because it, 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 am I right about those figures, about what yeah. you get at the bank versus what they're charging? I'm dumbfounded by it because I think the multiple was much less many years ago. It was. And it was. Still it was. The government has always been the one who made money off this. The government owns 85% of all student loans. They make $35 billion a year off of all of us. Um, in profit, in interest, you know, this isn't, so, so um, it is really a kind of a, not a great, not a very great way to make money. I would almost say despicable, but that might be too harsh. Um, it, it, and yes, they used, student loan interest rates used to be 3%, um, which I think, I don't have a problem with. I wish there were a better way to finance college education, but I don't have a problem with asking people to pay 1% or 2% or something like that back, but I'm all mine are at 6%. That's pretty good, actually, 5.5%. You're right, 8 9% for the graduate plus loans. That is up there. I mean, and yes, banks, banks, don't, borrow, banks don't borrow 1%. Banks borrow 0.25% from the federal government. And you know what they do with that money? They lend it right back to the federal government at 4% and 3%. We're, it, it's, it's a giant subsidy of the banks that keeps going because the Federal Reserve lends to banks at 0.25%. They then buy treasury bonds back and they, make, they just make 3% and go home. That's why they're not lending to people right now, by the way, because they can make 3% off of that. Why would they take a risk lending to a small business owner or something like that? Is this an issue for anyone? Apparently not. <laughs> it, it's just, it's because it's, it, it's so far outside the conversation, no one's willing to talk about it. I mean, we're talking, you know, it's, a, it's an ongoing, I don't know, $50 billion a year subsidy to the banks that no one talks about. I mean, but the truth is we actually have to sell our debt to someone if we're not going to actually, you know, fix that right now, uh, which we shouldn't fix it right now. We should fix it in a little bit and we should do it by raising taxes mostly and cutting military spending, of course. But, you know, uh, it's, it's, it, it's ridiculous. That that part's ridiculous. I mean, yeah, and they're they're making a ton of money off of it. And I, it's unconscionable. I have no idea why this is allowed still to go on. Why no one? Obama did try to get interest rates back down to three percent, and he did for a little bit. And then the Republicans, there was a there was an end date on it, and they didn't let it go back through. And now they're back up to six or whatever again. So um, I, I have I have no idea why they think that it's fair to make a 22-year-old who comes out of college start paying at 6% just because they're trying to take the only path left into the middle class, you know? 
I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, this is one of the things that makes me anxious and angry and I can only think about it so much, you know? Um, I have a two-part question. I'll be content with short answers. <laughs> um, my first is, these are personal finance questions. Sure. Um, I'm approaching retirement, but I will be continuing to work. Mm -hmm. Would you give different advice to me about where I should invest um, my, you know, my uh, cash I'll have available? Yes, I would. Then you would give to someone, say, half my age? That's the first part of the question. Mm -hmm. The second part of the question is, um, Members of my family keep telling me that I have to keep a large chunk of money in a completely safe place that earns less than 1% interest. Is that really necessary? No. Okay. <laughs> it's a great, great question. So these are questions that people always ask. Um, and I'm going to add one, one other piece of suggestion and advice to it, which is wait to take Social Security if you can. So uh, I'm going to explain that in a minute. A anyone who can, by the way, I'm just going to put this out there, should wait to take Social Security until 70. If you, can, if you can make it that long, it makes, if, as long as you're going to live past 80, as long as you think you're going to live past 80, you need to wait until 70 to take Social Security. You will, it will end up being the best for you. I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, but answer your questions first of all. Um, yes, you should be invested differently than I should. Um, but especially because you're continuing to work, you don't have to be too conservative yet. Now I'm worried about the financial markets. You know, I mean, they've been zooming up while the rest of the economy's staying pretty stagnant. There's a good reason for that, actually. Some of that is the subsidizing of banks. Some of this, there's a, some of this is because all these companies they don't, that, that we're investing in the stock market, none of them have any workers in the U.S. anymore. They're making tons of profits in Brazil or in Guatemala or in China, you know. So that's part of the reason the stock market is so disconnected from the U.S. economy right now. But that's also worrisome, right? But, but to answer your question directly, um, you, you should be at this point, if you're talking, you know, um, mostly retiring in, you know, let's say five years or ten years at the most, you should have a good bit in bonds at this point. But you don't need to be in a money market fund. You know, you can be in a good bond fund, uh, not like the one that I found, you know, but even, even, a, even a, a corporate bond fund isn't the worst thing to be in. I'm in I moved my stuff from that JP Morgan one into this PIMCO total return. And, uh, you know, I get five, four or five percent a year and safely, you know. Um, or a government bond fund, even a treasury bond fund will still give you 3% a year. And that's what you, you don't want to accept less than really 3%. You don't need to be in 1%, but you do want at least half, probably 60, 70% of your portfolio in bonds if you're five years off from retirement, you know. And then you can put whatever, you know, all stocks, whatever. So, um, second part of the question, um, I think that was actually both parts of the question, really, actually. Um, but the Social Security thing, I'll explain real quick, is that you get, you know, you get a larger benefit. You know, we call it actuarially fair in that uh, uh, basically they give you as much more a year based on, you know, what the math of the life expectancy and all that kind of stuff is. So if you take it at 65, the, the actuaries, the, you know, the financial, the accountant people expect you to live in, in six, 17 years is the number if you make it to 65, right? That's your life, average life expectancy between a man and a woman at, at, at then. So they just do your benefit based on that. They know that some people live later, some people live earlier, but it's a morbid calculation and that's how it works, right? Now if you wait till 70, th then actually your life expectancy changes a little bit, but they think you're only gonna live, let's pretend, roughly 12 years. I think it's actually 13, but let's ignore that, right? So, so, they, um, so they, they base your benefit based on that, right? Now if you're gonna live longer, if you're pretty sure, if you're healthy, you think you're gonna live longer than the average life expectancy, if you wait till 70, you will get more money from Social Security in the end. And not just that, but it's, it's a much bigger amount so that when you hit 85, 86, 87, 90, you've got a check every month that's like 33% larger than if you're at, if you're at uh, 65. So if you, were, if, you, if, you, if you took your benefit at 65 and you were going to get, let's say, $2,000 a month, if you wait until 70, it would be $3,000 a month. So it's a, it's a, it's a what we call it. It's a costless way, if you can make it till that what long to wait to claim, to make sure that you have enough money to last you the rest of your life. You don't have to worry about that. You know, it's, it's the cheapest annuity we say that you can provide. So anybody who can, and I can tell you more about that at some point, but you should wait till 70 if you can to claim Social Security. And, and by the way, your benefits aren't going anywhere. No proposals are going to cut benefits of anybody over 55. That is not anything that, that, that most people here have to worry about. Then nothing, you'll be fine, you know. <clears throat> yes, I wonder if people can have it. Uh, I wonder, 
Um, that your suggestion is something I'll think about, but I'm also thinking about quality of life versus quantity of life. Definitely. And, and if I'm bedridden or ill or uh, unable to move and I have more money coming in, that's bittersweet. It's a very good point. Kind of use it when you have the ability to use it. That's what I'm mulling over anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but what about gold? <laughs> in, I mean, it's, it, you know, the money in the mattress is not safe. Mattresses burn, and, but, what, <laughs> but gold is not edible either. And of course, dollar bills aren't either. But and how fluid is gold, and is it a good investment? Gold is going to decrease 15 percent in the next five years. It's it's uh, it's a gold has been a bubble right now. It's been a bubble because conservative people have traditionally sought it because they don't trust the Federal Reserve, so they put their money in gold. Gold has increased. It would have been great if we had all gotten into gold in 2000. Gold's increased something like 600% since 2000. It's insane. Uh, and that's because it's a bubble. People are putting their money in there. You know, gold's only worth what people say it is. It has no intrinsic value. You can't eat it, you know. Everyone just agreed that it's worth something. Literally, that's, that's why it's worth anything. And now people are, are souring on it. And it's already decreased like 10 something percent. And everyone, if you look, everyone thinks it's going to go down there 15, 20%. So, I, I don't. I maybe have more faith in this than other people. The dollar is not going going down anywhere. You know, um, it's gonna. Uh, it would be good if it depreciated against other currencies, actually, because then we would be able to export more and we'd have more jobs in the United States. But, uh, but, but the dollar is gonna. The dollar is gonna be fine despite all of this. You know, as I said, really, I mean, it's a weird thing to say, but if the U.S. economy really collapsed and the dollar collapsed, the whole world is, everything is based on our economy still and will be for the next 20 years until China or somebody else overtakes us. And then we'll still be, like, co-leaders, you know. So really, I mean, that is the thing. If this economy collapses, the dollar collapses, the whole world's in trouble. And that's, that's no exaggeration. So the dollar's safe. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and keeping your, and gold's not a good place. Silver's not as bad. Silver's not as much of a bubble. But... Yeah, <laughs> physically heavy indeed. Uh, but I mean, you know, honestly, a bond fund is just fine. Any kind of treasury bond fund, any kind of even even a, a you know corporate bond fund that doesn't have uh, because that's the thing. A bond always a bond provides a guaranteed guaranteed return. That's how it works. You buy a bond, it gives a return for fifteen or twenty years. Doesn't it can't matter what kind of bond it is. So it's a, it's a safe place unless it's as safe as anywhere is these days. Let me put it that way. So. Um, yes, thank you for your talk. I, as a reporter in the past, I've attended many events at Demos. And oh, wonderful. They're generally stimulating. But I wanted to touch on two points. Great. What about the encouragement looking into the not too distant future for um, new living arrangements, new economic arrangements? We're, you're talking about maintaining the atomized uh, nuclear units mm -hmm. that what but perhaps communal living if there's going to be a decrease in money w why can't we speak about communal living sharing um, where we don't have needlessly waste a lot of money duplicating things and millions of times over um, maybe instead of these ameliorative we should we should be embracing class warfare a rereading of Karl Marx or whatever, of, of Thoreau. Mm -hmm. And um, I go to Demos, but I see it's supported by the Rockefeller Brothers. Sure is. It's supported by Walmart on occasion. Mm, I don't think it might be Walmart, but yeah, bad, other bad places, don't get me okay. wrong. Yeah, we, we've got so Mifer Banks before, you know. The tentacles are everywhere. They are. My Occupy comrades uh, have taken their debts and they burnt their debts. Instead of figuring out how to repay them, as the draft card burners of yore did, they're, they're holding aloft their student debts and just burning it. I think we should encourage that. I would love to see more, much more organized resistance. And yes, I've been talking in a maintaining the status quo paradigm. I went to the new school. I was, uh, it's a Marxist, you know, uh, department. I uh, spent my entire college protesting. I was actually in prison for three months uh, for School of the Americas. Um, 
protesting School of the Americas. So I'm 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 spent my whole life working on, on on all this stuff, and I would love to see more organizing around it. I've just chosen myself to kind of let's address this paradigm as well as we can because someone needs to be fighting it, you know. And I think at the same time we can be organizing to try to get, you know, to try to really radically change it rather than just kind of fighting in within the status quo. I certainly agree with you. Um, but, you know, from my perspective, I would love to burn my student debt, you know, but I want to buy a house. And if I do that, I can't buy a house. I mean, that's as simple as that. There's no way I'll ever buy a house. You know, and that's a, um, I have a lot of friends in, in, in places like that, you know, um, and my, just my own path I want to I, I want to stay in the myself in this this world in this debate you know and if I'm going to be here you know I, I have to be in there but I, I would love to see much more organizing around that and I, I was part of the Occupy stuff as well I was there regularly at Zuccotti and everything like that and I, I'm I'm fully supportive you know but it's uh, for me to be able to stay engaged in this in this debate I have to I have to continue down this path and for me so that's why I'm making recommendations and so for people who want to change the, you know get out of that path wonderful let's figure out many more ways to do that you know but for people who feel like they have to stay in this paradigm for now we have to make the best of it to some degree so but I agree I would love to see much more support for any 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 and all alternatives to any of all this stuff that we're talking about whether it's community living whether it's different kind of systems of finance or money whether it's you know i you know any of that i i used to yeah so thank you mm -hmm. okay um i just want to make a comment uh regarding uh, what you said about i believe you said so if we can, if people can, mm -hmm. they can, they should wait until 70 before they claim their social security. Yes, right? ma'am. All right, I, I just want to mention something. I want to lift up something that I think a lot of people might not know. I did, when I turned 65, I did not claim social security because I was working at 65, okay? okay? When I did claim it, it was something like maybe uh, I think three years later, something like that, between two and three years, when my Medicare came through, I didn't realize it at first, but eventually I realized that I noticed that my premium was higher than it was supposed to be. Was Maybe I should have been so blanket in saying that everybody should wait, because there are lots of different considerations, right? And also the penalty lasts for the rest of your life. Exactly, that's true. You're paying 25 bucks a month the rest of your life. Now you're going to get a lot more than 25 from Social Security, but, but you're right, there are lots of considerations, quality of life and how you want to spend your life. If, if you have to scrape and scrimp through those years to make it to 70 so you can claim Social Security at 70, maybe it's not worth it, you know? There are lots of things. I just want to point out, because a lot of people don't know how much more you get at 70 and how much secure that can make you, potentially, just to the point I like to make, so. Okay, um, I, I've got I have Rachel, David, and then Teresa. Uh, but you said she's confusing. Well, Medicare and Social Security are two different things. You can collect Medicare. You can sign up for Medicare at 65, as you have to as a city retiree from right. New York City, and still not collect your Social Security. Right. Right. right, you can sign up for them at different times, but your premiums on Medicare are going to be based on whatever your income is, but right? Do you penalize if you don't sign up for Medicare at 65? Mm -hmm. Is, they have to answer. I, I didn't believe you were. My dad hasn't, and he hasn't been penalized. But that's. I, okay. I don't think A and B you are, but I think D, D you are. I think that's right. B you are as well. Okay. I just wanted a point of clarification. Uh, you were talking about the chain CPI, mm -hmm. and then, you know, 10 minutes later, you said something about if you're 55 or over, no changes will. Uh, yes. Uh, you're saying if they change to a change CPI to calculate our inflation increase, that if we're over 55, we're going to have a different calculation. We're going to have the old calculation, that's, and then people under 55 will have the new one. That's I mean, that's been a, that's a version of the proposal. I do not know, actually. I have to be honest. I don't know exactly. I, I know that some part of this proposal holds older people harmless, right? But maybe not. Uh, Maybe not this current version, but let me put it this way. I can't imagine that a version will get passed that doesn't hold people close to retirement, give them the benefits they're already promised, because that's, I mean, that's too big of an uproar. And, yeah. 
Right. I mean, that's the that that's what I would. That's why I was especially worried about it too. But I've seen different versions that say that they're that they'll hold people currently harmless. That that's just going to get changed for people who are who have not yet entered retirement. There's actually even some legal stuff there. Actually, there's some you have rights to promise benefits to some degree. So that's a. Uh, but but I but you may be right. I mean, some versions. I know that some versions have have said you know that that's the case. When I said that, also, I meant that. You're not going to lose a huge. You're not going. It's not like you're going to get half of what you're promised from Social Security. Now you, that could. Are you specifically asking about the change? You're right, and that. Yeah, and it's understandable. There are some versions where it says that. I don't know that it would ever go through. Is what I'm saying because, of, because of all the legal stuff. Because of, I mean, just the basic fairness, you know. But it is. It is. Don't get me wrong. It's not. It's not not worrisome. I understand being worried. I'm worried too. <laughs> I think it's ridiculous if they do that to people, especially who are already retired. I mean, that's just unconscionable, you know. You mentioned the events that took place in California with the passage of the uh, pension bill in the state. Yes, sir. I, I think you said it's not in effect yet. No, sir. Uh, here in New York City, John Boo, did he suggest a similar program yes, sir. in New York City? Yes, sir. Working with Teresa, my advisor, and, okay. and myself as well. Uh, so. Let's move on from there. Are we in a situation now in this country where half the people are poor? I think we are by some measures. I, I think it's about a third in poverty, actually. Um, but if for kids, kids now, the, uh, it's like 40% of kids in this country are in or near poverty. 25% are in poverty. Like, it's just unimaginable. And you're right. I don't know who, who this government's representing, honestly. I mean, I'm, I don't think it's any of us, you know. I mean, the last thing, I'll, I'll tell you, the only thing that I think particularly good that's been done in the past, I don't even know how many years, Heck, Nixon did the last good things, creating the EPA. <laughs> but seriously, I mean, I, I, Clinton didn't do anything. Honestly, I really don't feel like Clinton didn't do anything good. He destroyed welfare. He destroyed Glass-Steagall, which caused the crisis. He, uh, you know, he, he did, a, yeah, NAFTA. He um, d turned the government over to the private sector with federal contracting, waste of money. I mean, I like, you know, then Bush, we don't even need to talk about that. And Obama, like, actually, I will say, uh, Obamacare or the you know the ACA is actually going to be a good thing not because it's a good bill but it will lead to single-payer health care in about 10 years in this country and that is the only good thing about it so <laughs> the reason this is by the way I'll just explain everyone's gonna get forced onto the exchanges is what will happen because they put the penalty so low for the employers no one's gonna want to cover you anymore and employers shouldn't be covering people we it doesn't make any sense to have you follow try to have you go from job to job and keep health care like that no, we should all be in a same in a big pool. It's obviously what makes sense. And then once everyone goes on the exchanges, then they'll then they'll move the exchanges towards single payer. So honestly, the conservatives who said it was a ploy for single payer, they were absolutely right. So and thank goodness it was.